Sorry, why am I speaking in Italian? No, no. <laughs> um, Benissimo, ricominciamo in inglese. <laughs> Hello everybody, this is Tom from Los Angeles again, and uh, I have a delightful guest today. Um, I have with me Julia, who is joining us from Boston. But uh, Julia, first of all, thank you so much for joining and for helping me a little bit with uh, Canto 15 today. May I ask it's you to, a pleasure. In, to um, introduce yourself and what you're doing um, and where you come from? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so... I'm, I'm currently in Boston, as you said. I've been here for five years. Uh, and I'm a, well, academically, I'm a second year master's student at Boston College. Um, I'm graduating for like Roman literature and languages. And my focus is like, um, of course, Italian medieval literature. And well, next year, I'm gonna go for a PhD. Not sure yet what university yet, uh, probably Notre Dame, but I'm still, Ooh, you know, that's a good one. yes, yes, I'm very happy about it. Um, but I have a few options, so I'm taking my time to decide where to go. Excellent, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, uh, you, I've seen uh, uh, in uh, in the Boston University website that you uh, have been specializing in kind of mm -hmm. medieval literature. Of course, uh, that includes Dante a lot. Um, yes. Is there something uh, uh, for you personally about the Divine, Divine Comedy that you particularly like or, or why the Divine Comedy oh. resonates with you? Oh boy, that, that's a, like a hard question. <laughs> uh, well, I have to say, I, I always like approach the Divine Comedy more on a like um, linguistic and philological um, side, but uh, of course, like a uh, I think like the, the first time you read it, it's like a, every time you read it, it's like a new discovery, right? So you can even see it as like a personal journey sometimes, like you can find like some answers. And I read once like um, this book from, um, he was like an Italian professor, I'm blanking on the name. And he was explaining how it's like so contemporary when we're reading it especially for young people that we um, struggle with everyday life as Dante did and how like you know his way of kind of like passing through right those like darkness and then finding um, his own path right um, it really enlightens us all so I think every time I read it, I, I read it in a different way. Sometimes it's more academically and sometimes it's more like a personally to find an answer. Yeah, yeah, well, you said it very well, actually. This is, uh, uh, in, a, in a nutshell, what I love about uh, the Divine Comedy as well, how it, it can resonate with anybody at any time. Uh, it doesn't matter how old you are or where you are in your, in your life. It's, a, it's almost like a, a manual on how to achieve peace and happiness in your life only it's so long <laughs> also because it it's not it's not a very quick process not a quick and easy solution right that's so true yes mm, um, yes and i think every time like uh, um i approach like dante in general not just the divine comedy i found that uh, um he's you know, like well, being like Italian as you, like we studied Dante as like a sommo poeta, someone like unreachable, you know, like this super genius guy. Uh, talk about him, yes. But at, yes, right. But then at the end, it's so human um, in everything he says and that he feels. And that's, I think, the key for really um, reading his works and uh, relate to like what to him. Absolutely. Yeah, he, he, in the poem itself, he comes down and he becomes much more real and close to us than what some kind of cultural environments sometimes uh, paint him as. Sometimes, you know, they teach it to us in Italy as a little distant, but he's really close. He's really, yeah. really close. Um, very, very, very strong point there. Um, so I asked you, you know, which canto you'd like to discuss with me, and you you picked the canto fifteen. I'm so happy about okay. that because <laughs> I have no idea where how I could uh, explain this canto. It has 
so much richness, so much um, so much intensity for Dante himself because he was so uh, personally involved in these themes. You could almost say that Canto 15 is the first of uh, two or three cantos where Dante co communicates to us the, the core of his own personal involvement with the Divine Comedy, no? More or less? Yes, no, absolutely. Um, uh, you know, like Canto 15, 16 and 17, uh, you're almost supposed to read them together. Um, I mean, we can say because, you know, the main uh, uh, character is like Caccia Guida, but uh, uh, that, you know, follows like Dante in these three um, cantos, but also like Dante is, is reviewing something that he's been talking for forever since his very first uh, rime, uh, that it's like nobility. So he's taking uh, again uh, this concept of what is nobility and he's shaping again, he's rethinking it again, and he's like a, uh, proposing these new ideas to us through the figure of the character of Cacciaguida. So I think like it's impossible to read this canto without reading also like, or at least like acknowledging what's happening in the following one. Yes, 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 great point. Uh, and so we've been, until now, we've been uh, cooking in the heaven of the sun <laughs> for uh, about yes. uh, four cantos. And now, at the end of the previous one, we had this stunning, wonderful vision of the cross of light. And that's how Canto 14 ended with this uh, music and songs. And now from Canto 15, I think we're gonna, we're gonna be in the heaven of Mars for about maybe three or four cantos as well. So the, the permanence in the heaven of Mars is quite long. There's gonna be the famous uh, meeting with uh, his ancestor Caccia Guida uh, and uh, Caccia Guida there's going to be a little bit of dialogue between uh, Dante and, and him and a lot of uh, reminiscing about an old ancient Florence of how it almost sounds like the, the you know an old guy talking about the good old days you know everything was so good and now True. everything is gone to you know to the, the dogs um, True. But and it, it also like explains why um, in the first thirteen, I've never said that in English, sorry. So, you know, yes. like just at the beginning, he's talking about cupidity. And we know that for Dante, cupidity is the worst scene, ever, you know, ever. For Florence because, as well. Yes, the greed of like money and fame, um, there's like a need of having more and more this is what brought Florence to enlarge, first of all. Uh, historically, we have a moment where uh, Florence was just like a between, uh, literally very small, four um, walls with like a few, you know, like the Battistero was one yes. of the points. Mm -hmm. um, Actually, I do have a map around here. So we have the Battistero, and then there was like a Mercato Vecchio, and then Palazzo Vecchio with the other point. So it was just like very small center. And then slowly it like started to um, enlarge the city. And so what they're literally saying, I think it's so um, contemporary too, because we see uh, new people coming in the city, people that do not belong. Um, but then somehow they're like a new citizen. And this is what Dante is also describing, what they're like, they're facing. Yes. Old people, they're always been there and these new people that are coming from outside the walls within and trying to find their space. Yes. Most of them are like merchants. So, you know, they're like really, um, they're working with money. So, and that's where everything starts, right? The, the problem of nobility and who's really like a citizen of Florence, that's the discussion that Dante is making. Right, because obviously he feels uh, very much part of the nobility himself. And uh, he, he has to go down to his great, great, great grandpa to find uh, somebody who, according to him, uh, was knighted by the emperor, but I think historically we're not ex exactly sure that if they happened or not, no? True, true, exactly. Um, what we know is that Dante was definitely like from a wealthy family. Yes. Um, he was not a noble. 
um, it was not part of the aristocracy at all. However, right. he used to hang out with people uh, like Cavalcanti <laughs> exactly. and Donati, you know, like his friends were nobility, he wasn't. Um, so just in that, from the very start, we can see that he's like drawn somehow to be, you know, in a sort of like elite of people. Yes. Um, do we know if, Cavalca if Cachaguida was like uh, truly his ancestor and fought in the crusade? I don't know. Um, yeah. However, in that period, there was like um, the, the Florentine government were like very much against like this nobility and they were like trying to make this new law and saying, uh, um, okay, so if you're, if one of your ancestor, uh, if one member of your family is a knight, then you can be part of the government. But if someone uh, very like far yeah. back in your family is a knight, one, you can still be part of the government. And we need to realize that Dante is not just like a poet, he's like a um, politician. Yes. He was very much involved in everything that was happening in Florence. So um, I think that it, especially in these cantos, um, you know, the political side, it's very, very much present. Yes, um, that's another great point to highlight. We can, he, in his heart, he is unable to differentiate everything that he loves in terms of the history, the city, and the, the political aspect, because it's all one thing for him. It's all integrated, right? Um, okay, well, let, let's try to see what the canto is telling us. I think the first uh, tertine are um, almost like, uh, they feel very quiet and calm and relaxing after the big vision of the end of canto 14, no? What do you think? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I mean, what strikes to me is like literally the first three lines. Um, he's talking about this like good will, um, contraposed to the wicked will. Um, and I mean, I've been writing a little bit about this um, for like academic purpose, what la uh, rectitudine um, is, what direct, like direccio voluntatis is. Um, this idea of like habitus so for Dante was like essential, like knowing, not only knowing what, uh, what it's good and bad, but also like uh, um, you can do, I mean, doing good, it's like an active, uh, uh, repeatedly choice that you do. Mm -hmm. So it's like habitus, right? So this is what, what is talking, what is like love. It's like making like uh, being good it takes strength practically, right? It takes like everyday choices, everyday like decision towards a certain goal. And it could go both. Yes. Um, I mean, this is what people um, are in Inferno because they repeatedly choose to sin. It was their habitus. I'm happy you, you bring up this point because I, I was just chatting with a friend uh, uh, recently and, uh, we, and the point of why people are in, in Inferno came up and uh, he told me that one of the questions, even that a child could come up with when, when facing the inferno is, why is God punishing all these souls forever? When, whenever you give a punishment, you know, somebody is punished and then the punishment ends and you're punished and then you can go on with your life. But I was trying to explain that, like, like you are saying, Julia, it's uh, more, it's not that the souls in hell or in inferno are there specifically because of something they did. The, 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 the main reason, the most important reason why they are in Inferno is because of their heart attitude, their in, internal attitude of, sure. um, of not wanting to conform with the real good. They are, and that's the main <clears throat> reason, right? Yes, yes, I, I totally agree. And also there is like another, uh, you know, like another aspect, I think it's like uh, the pain and the suffering of these people in Inferno is eternal because God is eternal. So it has to be like a balance, right? Um, there, the scene ha has described in the Divine Comedy, uh, it's like, a, we really like in the, I think it's Canto 33, like the uh, frozen hearts, right? With like Ogolino and all this. It's oh, like, yes. Um, or maybe it was 32, sorry. Um, this is the fact, like they refused 
God eternally. And that's the pain is eternal. So I think it's like a perfect um, dichotomy between the two, between yeah. paradise that it's like eternal love and inferno that is eternal absence of love. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you, because you explained it much better than, uh, than I would do. So thanks so much. I don't think so. Um, thanks. Yeah. And so this is how Dante says, sempre l'amor che drittamente spira. That's really the rightly directed love, like you say. And uh, cupidità is this greed, the opposite of love. Um, and then this music that we are hearing at the end of uh, Canto 14 ends and fades away. Um, and then um, we get to this again, Dante uses the word bene at verse 10. He says, bene è che senza termine si doglia chi per amor di cosa. Again, he's repeating the word amor three times again mm -hmm. here, right? Bene, amor, amor. And so he really wants to make this big, big point here in terms of, how, in terms of uh, I have reached a point now in this uh, heaven of Mars where I am where I cannot almost imagine anything higher because this is the this is making me reflect on the utmost good that I can that I can imagine, no? Yes, yes, no, absolutely. Um, but also, I'm and now from taking away to a more uh, spiritual way of seeing this canto, I think is um, he's almost like a saying because he's going to talk about Florence like uh, very soon. So something that it's really, oh God, how is it is? Terreno, you know, like really grounded on earth. Yes. Um, so, but why like, you know, saying that he reached this high point and I'm, oh, you know, like my city over there, look at what terrible things are happening. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was so much better before. Sometimes it seems that it's not making sense that even if he's in paradise and he's living this like transcendent experience, his mind is still at Florence. And I think it's because through these lines, he is um, he's trying to do a lot of things. He's trying to maybe to teach, sometimes people say. Uh, he's definitely trying to warn Florence from um, not only like from the sinful, but also like from what it's like sinful, but also from what it can be redemption and what can bring Florence to light up again. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, so you're saying it's also a counterbalancing, right? Because he's going to talk about earthly stuff and very personal, specific stuff in the second part of the canto. So to make it more balanced and uh, uh, to compensate almost in the beginning, he gives us a little bit more abstract uh, uh, description. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I think that that could be like a, a good um, reasoning. Honestly, it's very hard to um, explain uh, <laughs> paradise very well because we're talking about something that it's so um you know out of our imagination even that, that it's very hard to grasp i think um, let's see how does uh, uh, the, the soul of uh, cacciaguida appear to dante uh, he sees it uh, if i understand correctly he sees it detached from this uh, uh, immense cross that he can see in the <laughs> They are actually inside Mars, right? So inside the, the heaven of Mars. And one of the yes. little lights starts detaching almost like a, a falling star, no? Mm -hmm. and, and we're like, a, I think around like a line 20. Um, it says like, A piedi di quella, cro di quella croce corse un astro della costellazione che li risplende. And then so like uh, right after his... Um, reminiscing about like uh, Ankis and he's like talking, right? There was like um, Enya father. And for the first time we have like uh, three lines, completely in line in the Latin. That mm -hmm. never happened before. Sometimes we have like words in Latin, but this time it's a full sentence. Um, and, and it's interesting because he already did it before, but he's somehow, so with the O Sanguinis Meus, he's talking about Aeneas' father. Yeah. Uh, we know it because of like um, Virgil, the fourth book. But then um, right after, he's referring to St. Paul. And he already did that. 
because he questioned himself at the very beginning saying oh yeah in uh, book two of inferno right exactly he says you and I, I know, and and I I went know. down the like in the inferi like you know in the ade yeah some paul dead why am i going to who am i for doing the same um journey that they yeah. did so canto, um, canto 15 almost gives the answer to this uh, deep question that he has exactly is, why why dante alighieri exactly and i think like Cacciaguida is going to give us the answer because he says somehow like um dante needs to know who he is so i'm going to tell you what your roots are as if like if we don't know our own roots we don't know who we are so again it's asking like why you know i'm doing this trip like this journey it's to know who you really are yeah which is and why do you think he's using latin to address uh, dante is it uh, only because of the time and the ages that uh, divide dante from cacciaguida or also to highlight the solemnity of the moment and how important this conversation because i think there are many latinism latinisms in in the canto itself no oh yeah oh paradise it's mm -hmm. full of Latinism. this this is what we learn right uh the language mutates from hell to paradise from using very like um earthly and quotidian and sometimes vulgar lexicon we have, and also like the structure of the sentence, of course, we have way more sophisticated. Um, Dante yeah. knew how to write in Latin. He, he had yeah. like a, he taught himself how, um, oh, he also like, a, you know, attended to schools, but uh, he was like an autodidact. I think this is how you say it in English. Um, mm -hmm. But he knew very well how to write in Latin too. And here, I think is because the referencing, um, you know, talking about an um, example, probably also for the high point of what we're talking. Yeah. Um, so he's using Latin. Yeah, in the Enaid, um, Enea meets with his father Anchise, maybe the soul of his father Anchise. And Anchise, um, I don't remember that particular, I think it's chapter six of the Enaid. Uh, there is a, a very moving scene of uh, paternal love. I remember Anchise, he's opening his arms and uh, hugging Aeneas. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that scene must have touched Dante very much. And so he wants to... Uh, recreate it somehow. Recreate it a little bit here, no? He yes. says, uh, yes, verse 26, he says, Se fede merta nostra maggior musa. He's talking about Virgil, right? Yes. Yes, I, I think I think you're right. Um, it's a crucial uh, moment for Dante, this free cantos, because soon um, in Canto 17, he's going to um, forecast himself through Cacciaguido words, the exile, the, like his exile. Oh, yes. um, he's writing this Divina Commedia for a purpose. And one of the purpose, well, for many purposes, but one of it is because he wants to make himself look to the eyes of whoever is like a god, like the government right now, like in Florence, so amazing, so good, that they, they need to take him back. That is never <laughs> going to happen. Uh, but he yes. is trying very, very That's hard dream. to do that. Still, he's still dreaming about this. Yes, yes, yes. So um, I think that this is also something to keep in mind while reading um, Discantos with Cacciaguida. Yeah. And then, um, as always uh, in Paradiso, when uh, something particularly surprising happens, the very first thing that Dante does is look at Bet looking at Beatrice. Say, oh <laughs> my God. Oh, almost like, Mommy, Mommy, what's happening? No? <laughs> That's true. That's true. Um, it's yes, she is. She's the love of his life, but she's also like a guide. It's true, she's very maternal with him. As Virgil many, many times was very, um, was like a father figure for him. Yeah. Um, and this, like, I think show us that uh, no matter what, we can go through life, um, life alone. We need a guide. We need like a um, figure that uh, can, um, you know, not just like give us answers, but 
it almost seems that um, this this journey he does, if he didn't have these guides, it would be just like an imaginary journey. But instead, the fact that someone else is doing them with him, it gives more uh, concrete thoughts to why he's doing. I re I really love that what you're saying here because you know it goes back to the fact that both you and I are Catholic, Italian Catholic, and yes. because the, the and the point that Divine Comedy is not escapist fiction is the opposite. It's a, a, a poem that helps us address reality even more, to go into our reality even more. And uh, any type of uh, spiritual growth, because it's a poem of spiritual development from uh, where we are to a better spiritual place, you cannot do it by yourself. Everybody in the history of Christianity has always said, you need a spiritual guide. It could be a priest, it could be a spiritual director, but if you do it by yourself, I think there was a saint who said, uh, if you're doing a spiritual retreat completely by yourself, the voice that you start hearing after a while, be sure that it's not God's voice, it's the devil's. <laughs> mm, that's interesting, but yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think like, uh, I don't know if at that time they had such like a deep understanding of Christianity, and don't take me wrong, but I think it, in the middle of the age, it was slightly different of how we uh, think about it. It was more, I'm going to say like uh, sovereign natural, but for us, it's more concrete and it's within ourselves. It's very personal, intimate for them because it was like an everyday reality. Everyone yeah. was like Catholic. Right. Yes. So there is definitely there no some more. Exactly. There was no exactly. separation. The, the big separation happened with uh, a certain concept of science and with enlightenment. Dante thought about yes. science in the same way that he thought about spiritual matters, which, which is very yes. different. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. Um, so, rivolsi alla mia donna il viso, e quinci e quindi stupefatto fui. It's beautiful, this quinci e quindi, because it's like him turning left and right, no? Oh my God, <laughs> what's going on here? Yes. Stupefatto fui, che dentro agli occhi suoi ardeva un riso, che io pensai, coi miei toccarlo fondo della mia gloria e del mio paradiso. Basically, here he's saying, I thought in that moment when I saw Beatrice's smile, that it was so incredibly beautiful that I, I thought to myself, this is it. This is the utmost, the peak, the maximum of joy that I can, of my glory and heaven that I can ever reach in my life, no? That's but, true. But you still yes. didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, and it's a very beautiful passage because somehow um, it tells us, it kind of like forecasts what it will happen like after because he's gonna see Christ's face in the virgin face, right? Um, and this is almost doing the same, like uh, this like fulfillment he has, it's from Beatrice's um, mm -hmm. you know, smile. Um, and I think it's like it could be made like a comparison or like a kind of like a mirroring in there. Um on like the importance of these like female figures in yeah. paradise and music he's starting, journey. He's starting to have some pre, some signs of what's going yes. on in the, in the final cantos. Yes. India would be a very giocondo. So in this point, uh, he's trying to listen, I guess, um, to what uh, his ancestor, at this point, he doesn't know what he's looking at, correct? Correct. Yes. He doesn't know who the spirit is yet. E quando l'arco dell'ardente affetto fu si sfogato, this means that uh, Cacciaguida is now regulating his language to a more understandable Italian. Is yes. that what you're saying? Um, I don't think it's like a, I mean, to my knowledge, I don't think it's like understandable Italian. I think it's um, a more like a perf language, you know, like, um, like our word language because okay. like uh, we have like this concept that it's very hard for like to grasp for us that in paradise these souls are like a spirit and then there is really like no voice and languages but there is music and 
everything is really like not tangible. So I think that maybe what he wants to say is that uh, he started talking in a way that he could understand. Maybe. Okay. Okay. He kind of lowered himself a little bit, no? To, mm. to Dante's uh, level. Level, yeah. You know, it's like um, what happened exactly with, um, you know, Beatrice, uh, Rachel, um, St. Louis, is they knew that Dante was coming because they allowed him to do this journey. So it's somehow the souls in paradise that knew that Dante was arriving. So I think like that's why Cachaguida had an idea that his descent yeah. was arriving. So that really those words where he says, uh, at verse 50, tratto leggendo, he, he's very grateful, but we know that Cachaguida has been waiting for his dear uh, nephew Dante. So because he had been reading the book of uh, the book of God. Well, he he tells Dante who he is. He, um, he's like explaining exactly how like, um, you know, um, why like a Beatrice like wanting him to talk to him, why it's so important that Dante understands that Dante first of all needs to ask him with his voice the right question and then Cachaguida is going to answer. Right. And then he's starting like if we go through and through um, to what is the main point. So there's like nobility that he um, inherited from Cachaguida who yes. was like um. Uh, who fought in the crusade and was nominated like a knight. So for him also Dante is part of the nobility. And, and then it starts this, this really like um, almost like nostalgic view of Florence of what the ancient Florence is uh, or was, I should say. Yeah. Um, in, in, and so in this point, I think uh, um, one, some of the most famous verses of this canto, and in fact, I always read them quoted by art in articles or people who are talking about canto 15, are uh, verse 97. Fiorenza mm -hmm. dentro della cerchia antica, ondella toglie ancora e terza e nona. It's... Uh, it, I think this is actually something that resonates with us Italians even more, and certainly more than for American readers, because we all come from, from towns and cities that have walls at some point. Yes. And obviously True. our towns, well, your town in particular, because it's Rome, and so <laughs> it's got a lot, a lot more history. Yeah, I like and a lot even, of walls, yes. Uh, but, in, in, you know, every little province in, in Italy has the, the old town, which is generally very, very small and protected mm -hmm. by crumbled down walls. And then you can see the expansion through history outside of the walls. And, uh, and this is uh, a physical reminder of the cultural and political uh, point that, that Dante and Cacciaguida are making here, which is that core of uh, values we, uh, we want to cling to them because that's what... So on one hand, maybe we could say that uh, Dante is speaking a little bit like the, you know, the old grumpy man who says, mm -hmm. oh, the good old times, uh, blah, blah. Oh, definitely is, 100%. <laughs> um, but at the same time, he's also uh, trying to moralize. He's trying to moralize and to indicate the right direction for the present Florence to go and that the right direction uh, has a lot to take inspiration from, from the old Florence, no? Yes, no, it's absolutely true. And I think what um, this idyllic perfection, what is like these virtues that Dante is like seeking for, for his own city, like, and we can read it like peace, um, sobri uh, sobriety, I think it's uh, like a sobrietà, and then pudica. Stava in pace, sobria e pudica. And it's like, I think it's beautiful because it's exactly what Dante is like living now because his city, it's not in peace. He just told us at the beginning of this can canto that the worst problem is cupidity. So the greedy, so definitely the city is not sobria anymore. And here we can open a huge like a conversation about it. So in Dante's mind, what is like Misura, we can see like in many times when, when he goes against like a greedy and cupidity, he doesn't want to renounce to all 
uh, gold, right? All richness. He doesn't want to do that. When he's in exile, he's in uh, really in true pain for being poor. There is his brother, Francesco, who is helping me, uh, help, helping him, will uh, sending him uh, like an allowance. And we even know that at once, like with this money, he bought um, a book of like um, the Aeneid, which were like very expensive. Oh. And also we need to think that uh, um, he was like moving from one Lord to another seeking for a place. So he wasn't doing very well after the exile. He yeah. knows what real poverty is. And then we move on and we see some Francis. But, and, and Lady Poverty. Uh, does Dante want everybody to follow Lady Poverty as St. Francis did? No, um, because he, he values money. He, val he knows that they're like uh, essential for living. Mm. But what he's really looking for is this moderation that sees the Florence lost. And we even have like in the second third scene here, it says, um, non faceva nascondendo ancora paura la figlia al padre che il tempo e la dote non fugge um, quince quindi la misura ah, and that's like right. um that that's like another point that he's making it's like these families they were like uh, you know selling the daughters um with a dowry uh just just because like maybe they will achieve back a title of nobility or maybe sending them to the monastery because they didn't have money. They were like, so his society in this moment, it's so unstable. And even Boccaccio says that Boccaccio is exactly on the same line of what Dante is saying here against Florence. And we yeah. see a fraud of the whole Decameron. Yeah. Yeah, that's so interesting um, because Florence for Dante was maybe comparable to New York in our times in the last uh, decades, all the biggest financial center um, of the place. Um, in, in his times, Florence uh, across maybe 100 years had become incredibly wealthy. And so the problem was too much money too quickly mm -hmm. and that had uh, uh, poisoned the environment no, in, in Florence. Yes, yes, no, uh, absolutely. And immigration, that was a huge issue too for them. All these people that came from outside of the walls, which did not mean um, exclusively from the countryside, but just like outside the walls. Um, and he even says in Inferno, I think if I remember well, was 16, is this gente nuova, so the new people, who brought the, this misura, which is the opposite of misura, the opposite of moderation, because they saw, I mean, I think you're right. It's like, uh, it's like New York City. People go to New York City to become rich. You know, they're looking for yeah. an escalation somehow, you know, like to, because they're greedy, they want more and more and more. And that for Dante is the worst. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I love, I love how really he, gets, he goes back to Florence and it almost sounds from the poetry that he gets uh, riled up again, you know? As soon as he starts talking about Florence, he uh, speaks about uh, very specific people or places, Montemalo, Uccellatoio, Bellicion, Berti. Mm -hmm. And so he, he has an uh, endless reservoir of uh, negative examples <laughs> about, about Florence, and he still hasn't exhausted them by, by Canto 15, no? That's true, that's true. But also like if we keep like reading, he is gonna say, he's gonna call for the Battistero and that's the center of Florence. So what is the center of Florence? Still it's Christianity because Battistero mm -hmm. is where he got uh, baptized. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the map he is drawing with these words of Florence, somehow tries to draw us back to the center of Florence, which is still what is to the Duomo, practically. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's beautiful, actually, because the, for Dante and for many um, Christian thinkers, philosophers, the center never moves from where it is. It's, the center is really eternal. We can say the cross is in the center of our life, of our yeah. world. Everything that is around 
can shift and move and change with the culture, the times, but the center never moves. No? That's absolutely true. Mm. Yes. And uh, anything else maybe towards the end part of the canto that you would like to comment or add? Anything that you found uh, particularly oh. interesting? Um, well, there is, it's still um, catch a guida, like, uh, you know, talking. Um, I think like the, when he's talking about um, the, the po il popolo che usurpa, and then he's talking about justice, he's talking about nequizia, he's literally setting up the ground for a more um, political interve intervention, like mm, that he's going to make it to the next canto. Yeah. Um, I think it's like a valid to, um, to ask ourselves why, like, um, why he needs Caccia Guida to open up again, um, you know, an argument against like Florence, because we know that, uh, uh, you know, he already talked bad about Florence in multiple Inferno. times <laughs> and then there was like you know and then there was Italy and then and now when because each six uh canto in each like yeah. uh realm talks about politics so Florence was way behind like we already passed that yes. but now he's back in talking and I think it's because he's realizing he's getting to the end he doesn't want to like leave the divine comedy without um thinking about his own people and for how much um, we can think that Dante is really an Italian citizen, I, I, we know like Italy didn't exist as we know it today, but uh, with all his like traveling, he is not uh, strictly linked to Florence, but he also knows that uh, this poem is coming to, to an end and he wants to uh, talk to his own people, to the people that uh, should take him back home. Um, yeah. And I think it's like somehow very beautiful going back to your roots. Um, and that's why he is looking for Cacciaguida. I mean, so, so Cacciaguida. Um, can we say that the answer to his main question, that is why me, why Dante Alighieri, instead of, you know, Enea, St. Paul, all these uh, great figures, part of the answer at least is that because he has some nobility in his blood, some, uh, some really kind of, let's call it high quality blood in his veins. Is that part of the answer? It's very hard to argue, um, to make an argument because so his idea around nobility is shifting during the years. If like, um, we, we already said this, he was always like, his friends were nobles, he wasn't. Um, mm. But at the beginning, he says, um, the virtues, he says, not because you're noble, you have virtues. Your father could be a noble man and have a lot of virtues. The son could be an awful guy. Okay, so the virtues do not um, necessarily, go yes, every tense, right? Yes, exactly. So, il cuore gentile, that's something that uh, it's divided from your social status. Yeah. But then he's idolizing this person who should rule. And the person who should rule as an emperor as nobility, but with nobility, you need like virtues too. So he's going back to putting these two together. So I don't think that this is why he's making this trip, why he's allowed to make his trip um, over this journey, actually, I should call it. Um, this journey is because God loved him. He saw the struggle Dante was facing. Um, at the beginning, yes. uh, with this like metaphor of La Selva Oscura, this is literally, I mean, people, uh, you know, we can argue people see in different ways, but like, uh, it's definitely like a moment where Dante is struggling with his life. He's being exiled, he's uh, like alone, he doesn't know what to do, penniless, what am I doing, right? Like, what mm. is the purpose of life? Um, and he, God loves him and allows him for this journey to find it again. So I don't think nobility has something to do with it. I think it's just a way of, of rethinking about nobility and just saying, you know, it's not because you're rich, then you're like a bad person. 
and I'm trying yeah. to like, you know, re- <laughs> um, trying to like make it sound like easy, but they've been writing, scholars and still write today about this. Absolutely. Um, you know, I know that uh, to, like, um, the schools of thought and they fight with each other. I'm, not, I'm aware. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yes. you know, yeah, I think in your interpretation is very reasonable because uh, here it's probably not as much Dante um, wanting to send a message about uh, you know the, the type of blood. Like you say, it's not like good blood equal good blood. Anybody right. can come out of a tree. But it's more the relationship with, uh, with history, the, the relationship with uh, you know, his own biography and Dante Alighieri as part of history. Because he was such a, a meaning-driven person, He's trying to find meaning in every aspect of his life. And so this is part of the meaning that he has for himself uh, when he compares it to the, the history. And also the, the type of interpretation of history from the divine point of view. That's also another yes. big theme in the divine comedy. The fact that uh, uh, God is uh, using history as a, as a tool for divine providence in a way that we don't really understand it, but it develops in a certain direction. And Dante, I think, wants to, to show that to us. The, the aspect of Dante kind of raising his hand and showing that he's deser he deserves to go back to Florence, mm -hmm. um, does it also has an important, was he also hoping that um, the emperor, like somebody like Henry VII would uh, intervene and maybe, you know, push, people to <clears throat> let him go back to Florence. I think there is a, a, a part of that. Yeah, um, it might be, I don't remember exactly when, but, and I think it's like a Canto 17, there must be like a point in paradise when he knows that is not gonna happen. Because of course he's writing it after events already happened in mm -hmm. history. And we know that at the end, this great emperor, this Veltro, the, a lot of people said that the Veltro at the beginning is this emperor. At the end, I never put like a um, piece yeah. in Italy, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I think he lost his hope in that. Uh, he mm. lost his hope in a lot of things, like um, more than the emperor. He, he believed, he strongly believed that. So the, the first time he gets like exiled, he's in Rome. Um, and I'm trying to like uh, ease up stuff uh, like events, but so he's in Rome, Boniface uh, the eighth. It's really uh, upset because, and again, it's all about money. So there are mm -hmm. like there's like rich people. Uh, they hold the the banks, and on one side we have the Cherki, and on the other side we have the Spini and another family. And if the Pope before like better the Cherki, now Boniface is like you know, he prefers the spinning. And uh, of course, like this is, this is essential because who commands Florence? The family that has a bank that works with Rome because Rome yeah. and the papacy is like the, the biggest client, the best client. Sure, um, sure. And so the, the Cherki are like, and this is how they're dividing wealthy, like in the black wealth and the white. Uh, wealth. Yeah. Uh, but once, like, he get exiled, he unifies with the Ghibellines, which is absurd if you think about it, because they've been fighting uh, against each other for so long. Forever, exactly, seeking, exactly. Yeah, he's seeking help with other people of his same town of being exiled. So he goes back to the Ubertini and tries to make an alliance. Then they try to go back to like Florence. There is also like the um, Francesco Petrarca father, like, um, you know, kind of like in this um, reunion of people. And oh. through a cardinal, they're trying to make peace. They can make it. He needs to run to Bologna. But then the Guelphs are like back in Bologna and they're like trying the, you know, trying to practically push them out. And this is how his real exile starts from Bologna. Okay. So okay this poor guy like um if we think about it he made a, like a lot of bad decision why he was the priore of Firenze um he Bonifacio Tavo really hated him because he wanted the money for Florence to do like a yeah. war against yeah. them 
against like a family in Maremma, I think the Aldo Brandeschi. And Dante voted for like, no, we're not going to help you. And of course, the Pope was like, why are you not helping me now? I'm going to like have you exile. And this is how Dante gets exile. Yeah. Like so the period, it's like unbelievably crazy. There was no rules at all. Yes. Um, yeah. It, that's why probably we, we shouldn't be too surprised when we see, you know, after so many cantos that he's still going back to the same point. I think uh, in the last yes, exactly. uh, lines here, 144, 145, he's saying per colpa di pastor, he's still pointing his finger at the Pope, basically, no? Yes. And, uh, you know, it sounds like uh, every one of us has this kind of uh, older uncle who has his own uh, little kind of <laughs> recurring thoughts and recurring speeches, and he always gets riled up yeah. and repeat. Um, at this point, if you've been uh, reading the comedy with uh, a lot of attention, we, you know Dante very well, and you know where his heart is. And so in, it doesn't surprise me that he goes back to these points, because that's what is in his heart. Um, it's difficult to answer yes. the question, uh, like, you, like you were saying before, why is he doing this at this point in Canto 15? Hasn't he done it enough? Hasn't he beat the dead horse mm -hmm. a lot already? Yes, we're also like on the planet of Mars. So that could, to like a certain extent, give a key uh, for, for the question we just raised. It's like, um, you know, Mars as a war, there is the war between Florentine people. So maybe this is like a good um, yeah. time to bring up again this topic. And more now, like after the 17th canto, practically we're all talking transcendent. There's not going to be like um, that, like a earthly connection anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and he tries very, very hard. Um, and he believes that he's going to make it. He knows how good he is. This is the, the thing I've learned about Dante. He's a very um, proud and he thinks very high of himself. So with and, a lot of like nostalgia and pain. Yes. And, and he knows that. He knows that he's going to be in Purgatorio in the terrace of the prideful, no? Yes. When, uh, when, after he dies. And maybe he's still there today. <laughs> <laughs> True. True. Um, okay, well, uh, this has been an absolute utmost pleasure, Julia. And um, thank you for me too. I'm, I'm really hoping that uh, people listening have been uh, finding this uh, a little bit uh, clarification or useful from uh, two Italians. One who is Julia, a little bit more qualified than the other, but still, we I try. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely not. And, uh, and thank you so much again, you know, we'll, uh, we'll have a, an opportunity, I hope, to uh, talk about Dante in the future again. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It was a very nice time. Thanks again. Thank you for, for inviting me. Bye.